intimidated because I am one of those semi-literate computer users who is standing before you with the hope that I will be able to place my wish list, my dream before you and see if I can co-op you into that larger <laughs> process called education. Uh, we represent the government. We are. I am from the National Council of Educational Research and Training. So all those of you who have had a bad education can blame us. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I also have colleagues uh, with me, uh, Professor uh, Arun Mehta, who works with the National University of Education Planning and Administration. And uh, one of the important data sets that's coming into education is the District Information System of Education, DICE. And uh, he will, of course, be giving you a, a, a longish presentation on that, so therefore I will not get into that. <coughs> the other colleague of mine, Parthajit Das, he works with, along with DICE, he also works with what is called the National Achievement Survey, which we do across the country. And this, again, is a very large data set. While DICE concentrates on school administration, school uh, planning, school uh, activities, which happen at a school as a structural unit level, uh, the National Achievement Survey gets into what children are learning, how much have they learned in maths, how much have they learned in language, and so on. So that's the other kind of data set. Uh, but what I'm there for, because both of them are going to be speaking during the day, uh, what I will try to concentrate on is another initiative of ours, which currently does not have data, but has enormous potential for allowing you plugins into it and getting uh, into data, which you will help me understand I can actually get out of it. Uh, this is a platform called the National Repository of Open Educational Resources. Uh, let me give you a brief context on why we began this, why, why we believe it is necessary. Uh, there are a very large number of government organizations which were into creation of resources, creation of educational resources, many of it in the audio-visual medium. As soon as radio became available, we started making audio programs. As soon as television became available, we started making video programs. There are large collections of photographs available, large collections of all kinds of printed resources available. But then, thanks to the fact that primarily we were in those big beta uh, tapes or we were in, in media which was not really accessible, we have remained as libraries which were locked and not available to the public. Uh, oh, we had banked upon Doordarshan, the time when we were born and we were, you know, first introduced to television. And I remember having traveled 50 kilometers to somebody's house, I don't even know who it is, to watch the first ever television show. And that was uh, a cricket match. But since then, uh, we had only one channel and therefore the hope that, you know, there would be a significant chunk of it being made available to education. But what has happened after that is, one, Doordarshan became Prasar Bharti and therefore started masquerading as a company. And Thousands of other companies got onto it, and there are many more channels than programs today on television. With the result, what has happened is that education television is no more a premium. We did we did attempt other channels, other uh, channels exclusively for education called Gyan Darshan and Gyan Mani, uh, both of which are currently stopped. Stopped because some institution has not paid up Durdarshan for those cable fees. Or Okay. So anyway, uh, without getting too much into the politics of this whole thing, what we have discovered is that broadcast television is not something that we can rely on. Broadcast radio is not something that I can rely on. I almost suspect that parents would not part with the remote in the evenings to allow children to get education. If you can do a little arithmetic and figure out that even if I had access to a dedicated pipe into the school with a television channel, if I am looking at class 1 to class 10 playing out there, and then in every period there is some uh, sometime social science, sometime mathematics, sometime English, and so on. If you take this matrix, you will figure out that there is no way a broadcast pipe into the school can actually service this need. Different classes are teaching different subjects at different points in time. In the chapter itself, there would be someone who would have started yesterday, someone who would start day after. So therefore, it's not possible to configure this kind of thing. A custom on-demand channel is what would particularly serve this purpose. We don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the reach, we know that millions of children in this country will never perhaps have access to a decent enough television screen to watch whatever it is. So we are considering ICTs. So this platform basically grew out of this problem that we had. Uh, so, so basically I'm introducing to you the National Repository of Open Education Resources. It began as a, as a project within the NCERT. But NCERT will also be one of the partners of the National Repository. We will continue to curate it. 
We will continue to manage all the technology that is required for that. But we would content wise be one of the partners. Who else can be a partner? Literally anybody. Anybody with anything digital, anything digitizable in any language for any sector of education. And you either have resources with you or believe that you can use those resources for a plugin into the school system. You want to teach using those resources, you want to conduct an event around that, you want to run a contest, you want to run a tutorial, you do whatever it is that you believe you want to do. That's the large, wider dream that we have. And as you see on the slide, uh, this is something that will be in all Indian languages, which, which raises some technological issues, but perhaps data people are not the people who are going to solve that, but we'll come to it. Uh, it's, it's essential to flag this part of it that we are looking at something like 150, 200 languages in which school okay. education currently happens in this country. Yeah. So, one quick, uh, so let's say somebody creates quality content in one Indian language, let's say Hindi or English. So I know the technology is perhaps not there yet, but can you can we try to build tools uh, we, uh, which automatically makes it available, like transcribes it or does some. Speech. Uh, we haven't resorted to the technology medium to do this, but we have the ground forces to do that. I have I have one team of people sitting in every state, every union territory today, about 400 strong, working in about 29 languages. So we have this large group of people who would overnight pick up something from here, translate it into some other language and pass it on. It won't be uniform, it won't be, uh, you know, it won't have the validation that perhaps is required because finally you're communicating something which is technical, something which has to be factually correct and so on. But we do have the mechanism of a large group of people who are translating. And if many more want to join in, we have the mechanism through which we may be able to invite them. Is this just the scope of primary education? Or? Uh, this is class 1 to class 12, and then teacher education, simply because there exists in the ministry a department called higher education, which believes they are a different group. <laughs> so, so it's just that, but otherwise class 1 to class 12 and then teacher education which is the BA, DA, MA, that kind of It's an equivalent of NPTEL. Yeah, it is the, uh, the analog of that in the school education sector, okay. school and teacher education sector. And as I mentioned in the second part of this uh, slide, uh, every resource here is released under the Creative Commons. This again, if you have looked at what government has been doing earlier, what publications have come out till now, how different agencies within the government have looked at content, Doordarshan does not allow me to access a photo free if I have received an award from the President of India in Vigyan Award. They say that you can only buy it from us and you can use it only for smart. Included by the Yes. yes. So, we have grown with that mindset. We, we find it difficult to open up, we, but, but we are considering other options. So from that perspective, this is a sea change. We are looking at this entire content which is existing on this portal being released under CC by SA. Of course, some portions of it have an NC clause on it, and some portions we are even tolerating an ND clause on it. But that's it's still CC. It's still freely downloadable, distributable by everybody there. And so the one of the conditions for participation in this portal would be that you agree that your content is going to be released in this manner, allowing it to be adapted into all the other languages, adapted by various target groups, uh, reinterpreted in manner in which it becomes more accessible to the target group that they are handling. Actually, one question. Yes. What is the uh, is the content from NCR released by only PC by SA? Uh, the NCERT textbook has a license. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll get into the details of it a little later when I come to the ebooks part of it. Okay. The way we have organized this content is in this manner. There are three major sections: the repository itself, the partners, and the groups. And one of those first things that you say there is what you were referring to: the ebooks. We are in the process of converting all the textbooks NCERT publishes, and they are 324 separate titles in English, Hindi, and Urdu for classes 1 to 12, all subjects. And every chapter of this is available as an EPUB file. EPUB 3.0 is what we are using currently, and they would be freely downloadable. The license associated with this is distinct from the license associated with the printed book. Currently, if you go to the NCERT website, you find a PDF with a watermark on it. Okay. Those books will be phased out the moment I become, you know, uh, I get the EPUB version of it. The printed book will no more be available on the NCRT website, but the EPUB version will be available. We worked around the license part of it 
by actually creating a separate license for this, and therefore these two books carry a separate ISBN number, a distinct ISBN number, so that this is identifiable. The electronic version is distinct from the content-wise identical, but we have enabled it to be released in this manner. The hope is that in the next two years, all those 25 different states across the country which produce textbooks for the school system in a variety of languages, all those textbooks will also be available there, mapped identically. So the next time you want to go say, sound, I want to teach sound, you actually have access to 25 different versions of how sound can be taught in the eighth grade. Okay, so that's the hope that we're looking at. But then, the way we look at books and the way technologists have started <coughs> playing with this concept of a book is slightly different. And I believe those of you who get interested in using a book technologically, uh, you would appreciate our perspective on that. The textbook was created as a resource for the child. The textbook was never intended to be taught in the class. We would not like the English teacher to be teaching the English textbook in the class. We want that teacher to teach English. And there is a sea change between these two concepts, what we consider as the English textbook and what we consider as English. Okay, so. Using the textbook in the class as the primary vehicle of communication comes in the way of enabling that child to think, the enabling the child to do a lot of other things which, which we believe education is all about. So therefore, we are in some senses of the word dumbing down children by the time they get out of school. So we would not like the e-books to be embellished with connections to various other websites, videos plugged in into it, photographs being given there, a slideshow running out of some small portion. Hence, the textbook will also be one of the resources available along with various other resources that will be there on the repository. So when you next, when this is completely uh, uh, evolved into that kind of a thing, you search for your concept, you go to that concept, and around that concept, we give you a variety of digital material, and you actually create your own little library of collecting all of these together. Some of them would be interactive, some of them would be exercises, some of them would be a set of problems, some of them would be textual reading material, some of them would be an audio, video, you name it. The, the entire geometry, whatever, that could be digitized and placed. So this is the context in which the ebook should be perceived. Uh, shortly in this month, we would be releasing a mobile app for this purpose. The reason why 7th standard has science and 8th standard has science and 9th standard also has science, but if you look at the 6th, 7th, 8th standard textbooks together, you will find sound only once, light only once, electricity <coughs> only once. It's a cycle. It's, it's, it's a small group of classes together taken as one stage of education. So we have classes 1 to 5 as the primary, 6, 7, 8 as upper primary, 9th and 10th as secondary, 11th and 12th as upper, higher secondary. So in each stage, we articulate the syllabi. And therefore, there can be multiplicity of textbooks, multiplicity of ways in which it can be taught, but then that unit is taught in that sense. So what we have done here is we have picked up the national curriculum framework, which is what the NCRT uh, creates, develops. And then uh, this is something that is uniformly followed across the country. So you have a mapping saying that if you are in the upper primary stage, these are the topics that have to be taught. This is the way it is ordered and so on. And against those topics, we are managing to map in all the resources that we have on this platform. <coughs> So that's why the curated zone. So the curated zone is a convenient way in which a teacher or a student who's studying that subject can access that material. Otherwise, you go into the e-library, you're lost. There are so many thousands of resources there that you won't be able to uh, navigate. This, what we have done is we have plugged in the Open edX MOOC platform into the national repository. Uh, it's not yet operational, but a month away, we should be operational. And we are planning to create courses for teachers, courses for teachers, uh, students. So for a student, every topic that is there in the textbook would be articulated as a course. And for the teacher, the same course would be articulated as a refresher program, along with an introduction to the methodology, the possible pedagogies that should be used in the classroom, and so on. And therefore, we believe that can become an online training mechanism for teachers in service teacher training, and so on. Or also, the students who are in the teacher education program can benefit from these courses. Again, this entire structure is open. So I would, I would think that one of you is going to actually start creating a course on one of my wish list, which I'll come to towards the end of it, that here is this headmaster who was a science teacher for 25 years and suddenly has been promoted to become the headmaster. And today he's asked to learn bookkeeping, inventory management, <laughs> teacher management, creating our timetable, and so on. 
the chap poor chap doesn't have a clue of what this is all about. So maybe you would create a small little course for him and tell him how to do double entry bookkeeping. Okay. So th this is the open structure that we are looking at. The course platform is available. Somebody creates a course. Whoever wants to enrolls into it, and if that course is good enough, maybe the state will say, okay, this is a part of our bouquet, and this will be available for other teachers. The uh, the e library is that larger interface because that the events part of it. The events part of it is essentially uh, a way in which you can create a contest out of something that is already existing here, an exhibition of some resources. You want to celebrate some festival or some you know occasion, or you want to have groups of people doing some activity and then creating some resources for that. So anybody can go about organizing an event using the resources that are there in the e-library. The e-library is that master library, where everything digital would have to walk in. Currently, we are looking at all the material that are there in our institutions. All of them have been released as uh, CC by SA. And I'm not just referring to the NCERT. I'm looking at various state organizations which are part of this. Okay, So we have material in about 29 different languages, many of them tribal languages today. And we also have groups of people who are making <coughs> personal contributions. I had this photo, I had gone to such and such a place, I have take, taken this photo, I have written a little story, I have written a little poem. Those have also started emerging on this as content. The second way in which we have gone about organizing this is, as I mentioned, partners. And partners is, you could be a, a state, a state would be a partner. We are looking at the model where NCERT has, of course, the capacity to handle this in English and Hindi and we will restrict ourselves to that, but allow every state to articulate its own language. In June, I'm having a meeting with the DSERT Bangalore here, and they are in the process of taking over the Canada part of this repository. So every material that they have, which they can port onto this, that will become available. Similarly, we will go after every state. Every state will become a partner. They will start managing their part of the portal. The <coughs> distinction between this and the current web initiatives is that here is a common platform. So the people who are participating in this no more need to worry about the technology part of it, no more need to know, have programmers on to it, no more need to worry where that data is being stored and how it is being managed and all that. That we have asked the NIC to look after. Okay? Uh, so there's going to be a cloud available to us where this data is going to exist and it will be all kinds of uh, information and data. So the states can be a partner, institutions can be a partner and that institution need not be a government institution. Except that you buy in into the idea that you're going to give me material in CC by SA, you're not going to do anything commercial on that platform. Okay? And of course, conform to the basic legal restrictions of doing whatever that you're doing. You're going to be sensitive to everybody, you're going to whatever is the educational principles that we hold to be about. Individuals can also be partners. And today, for instance, there are a large number of people who run small blogs where they are articulating their own ideas on various things. Okay? And you go and tell your friends, look, I am existing here. I have put out a new page. Please come and see it. Okay? You don't have visibility. You don't have a plugin into this. So, so by making a page on this, we're essentially saying that all teachers in the country have access to it straight away. Uh, and you could leverage that to focus on very specific issues in that. Maybe you're passionate about maths. Maybe you're passionate about drama. Maybe you're passionate about singing, whatever. Whatever is that uh, subset. As long as you believe there is some teacher, there is some student who will benefit out of what you are doing, we will allow you to be plugged in. You can access all the resources, you can repurpose them, collect them differently, and start using In fact, one of the subversive uh, objects that I have in this portal, and I, and I hope I'll be able to realize it very fast, is what I call the open textbook idea. Textbooks are always priestly prescriptions of what should be taught and how it should be. It says that knowledge can be packaged in one particular way, which is uneducational. So I believe that teachers should be on this platform, and they should start arguing out as to what is, what are the possible ways in which this particular topic should be taught. If there are different groups of children, perhaps having different needs, perhaps in different socio-cultural contexts, they want it articulated differently, then how should that happen? So the plurality of all of this should exist there, and that's what we call as an open textbook. So maybe you'll come back today and say, no, no, my class did not work well. Let me edit this portion. And tomorrow morning, there's going to be a new chapter there. Yeah. Uh, to an extent, I have a peer validation process. Every member who's registered onto the NROER is also a reviewer. And we have a transparent mechanism of <coughs> referring your material to three other people and saying, OK, you are not offending anybody. You are factually correct. You are uh, you know, at the 
appropriate level. See, unfortunately, when you look at higher education, everybody is an adult. So you write it in one, one style. But if I write the same sound chapter for 7th standard, for 11th standard, for teacher education, I would write it differently. So because of the uh, growth uh, stages of these children. So therefore, that danger does exist that somebody is going to write something which is going to be uncomfortable to someone. Okay, But if we don't start respecting this diversity, we might not be contributing to that fellow thinking in the first place. Okay, But at the same time, if he can defend it across all the rest of the people who are going to pounce on him, then we would have created a healthy precedent of argument, of debate, of reflection and critiquing, which I believe is one of those things I want to do through this book. So it's an enabler. If there will be dangers, how do you know you have been taught the correct history? All right. So sometime you will unlearn it and that's where the hope is that each of us are resilient enough, each of us are not going to be swayed away by uh, content which is uh, wrong. And even if we have learned it when an alternate way of presenting this comes about, then I am willing to accommodate that new way of doing Okay, But the last word cannot be said on such things. Yeah. My question is, uh, CK-12 actually does all this in a significantly huge manner and yes. states are adopting in the US huh. these things. Huh. Can't such a thing just be all adopted rather and then adapted? Yeah, I mean, rather you're than making, having see, uh, uh, I, do, I do agree that uh, there are a large number of uh, Creative Commons uh, resources available out there. CK-12 is one of those things in which many of my own colleagues, my teacher colleagues have written chapters into and we are trying to see if we can port okay. them into this. But then to say that there is one way of doing things would no, not as be as one right. of the things. As one of the things. Yes, yes, we are looking at it. We are looking at all possible open source uh, content available everywhere and trying to see how they can be ported in. And that's why the partnership model, that's why the thing. So, so much so that if CK12 as an agency believes they want to hold on to their identity, <coughs> they can become a partner institution and then they continue to you know hold up their portion of it. For instance, I have Vigyan Prasar as one of my partners today, and they have a very large collection of videos which come on Durdashan, uh, all the science popularization programs, some three, four hundred videos that they have given us. So we will give them an identity. We will give them a space where they can continue to say, all this material came from us. NASA is one of those sites that I would certainly like to pick on and uh, take up. So only the curated zone is this zone where I don't let everybody creep in. But in your institutional space, in your partner space, in your personal space, you are allowed to pick from anywhere as long as those license conditions are maintained. Okay? We are not trying to duplicate efforts unnecessarily. There's nothing, nothing sacred about the way we want to articulate things. If, if there is a good resource, if there's a good experiment, a good simulation, the FET simulations, for instance, have become part of our material. A large number of us were creating GeoGebra applets. It's a mathematics uh, geometry software. And uh, GeoGebra Tube is a very large collection of material. So we are sifting through that and figuring out which of them we can pick up and put onto this. But then we are not in a hurry to take the web and put it into NROER. We consider NROER as a part of the web. In fact, so much so that to me, the objective of introducing a teacher to NROER is to give her a, a, a kind of a structured uh, room where she can practice her skills and then go to the web. The web is certainly larger. It's that every teacher, like a Facebook account, would, would actually have a page on this in which she personally goes about articulating whatever. She would also have a personal dashboard giving her indications of what courses she is taking, what events she is participating in, who are her other uh, colleagues with whom she has partnered or worked together on various things and so on, uh, which has the potential that once teachers start celebrating what they are doing and they start getting uh, enamored by the increase of those numbers, perhaps they're going to get a little more motivated to do what they are doing. Uh, also, that much of the uh, award processes that happen in the country, somebody gets a national award on this and a national award on that, can be informed by tangible inputs that they have made here rather than other considerations. So the other thing is that we are going to plug in every school into this, every school getting its own little page there in which they can start putting in material. This opens out possibilities for data, which I'll uh, explain to you shortly. The third thing that we are looking at is groups of people forming together, coming together and forming an interest group. It could be a dog lovers group, it could be a geek group of your kind, it could be anything practically. But these are registered members who are focusing their attention on some such uh, activity. It could also be various institutions which are trying to do something specific. Every department of NCERT would perhaps be one of those interest groups. They might want to run a journal, they might want to run a contest, they might want to run an exhibition of some kind, whatever, whatever it is that they can visualize. So what are we? 
hoping or dreaming about. One is that this very concept of groups is something that we, we believe will plug in every teacher in the country, every school in this country onto it, which in itself is a very large data set. We're looking at something like 15 lakh schools. We're looking at 10 times that number of teachers. We're looking at all kinds of specializations and subjects and uh, you know areas in which they teach and so on. So we would like schools to be helped, helped in reporting the data that they have. There would be children with special needs there. There would be children with very specific social handicaps of various kinds. There would be children who would require some support of the other of various kinds. There is such data available, but the teachers don't even know that they can actually report this somewhere and get somebody else to act on it. If not anything, there must be hundreds of children who require a pair of spectacles and they don't know that they are having this problem. So even this kind of mappings don't exist. This kind of data simply doesn't exist there. There are a large number of children who can swim, who can jump, who can run very fast. Nobody really knows them. And the selection trials happen, somebody in the city will go there for the selection. Okay? So there is a possibility of data coming out of each school becoming very valuable inputs into how everybody can be encouraged, everybody can be made to participate in this whole process of education. And I'm seeing that possibility that it could help us out of it. There, there aren't adequate inventories of material that is there in the school. A convenient app for that is not available. Report, reports of schools don't exist. Reports of children exist, but then reports of schools don't exist. Which school has infrastructure, which school doesn't have, which school has a playground adequate for the use of some particular thing. So you would have a nice little cricket set with more space to play cricket in. So that kind of, even, even from a supply position, states would like to be informed on various such data sets. So there, there is a large possibility there. I mentioned to you about the head teacher being helped with financial accounting, but then there are a large number of other things growing about that we've got 100% results in our school. They, they aren't sure whether all of those fellows were getting 60% marks or were they getting 100% marks. So where is that distribution? Is it because everybody did well, very well in social sciences and therefore got those first classes? Is it that everybody is good in maths, everybody is good in science, everybody is getting equal attention in all those subjects? There's a lot of potential in that kind of data that can come out from And we also see possibilities where we can be helped through automation of many of these things. Because currently, every teacher would be given a printed booklet and say, sit, don't teach for the next two days. Sit and fill up this form, because the state requires this. We, we indulge in a lot of wastage, which ICTs can deliver us from. So our wish list, we are hoping that you would help us design meaningful interfaces which will allow almost on, on the fly entry of data without even the teacher realizing that she is now switching over from that activity and actually doing some data entry. One immediate example that I can think of is giving an app to a sports teacher which has a, you know, a, a, a meter which allows her to clock children's timings in races and things like that. Enter that data in, plug it in, it goes off, comes back again to her, her little graph figuring out where her children are and so on. So that kind of things could happen. We are hoping that you would enable all the functionaries. See, the structure of education, which I think Professor Mehta would explain to you about the various uh, intermediate stages that exist in the school administration structure. We are looking at some things in the block, something in the district, something at the state level, and so on. Each of these people have different needs for data and how that should be visualized, how that should be analyzed, and so on. So that we hope you would be able to help us with. Disaggregation of data is one of those most important challenges we have. We have large compilations of data, so therefore we can draw one little graph out of it and therefore lose out on everything that could have been meaningful at various lower stages there. The school itself is filling up all of this data, but the school is not making use of this data. So we, if, if there is some way in which I can take just that subset of that school and help that school understand, okay, the data that you put in here has these meanings, is, has these kinds of inputs for you. So that's something that I'm hoping that you would do. As I mentioned, I'm an education fellow. I started as a primary teacher. My PhD is in primary education. And if you ask me what are you good at, I'm good at teaching children small things. Data, big data, software, all these things are frankly not our forte. We have uh, a bunch of enthusiastic people who are trying to do all of these things, but then we don't really have the bandwidth to create various other devices that we need. So we need 
first of all help in clarifying that we are on the right track we're doing the right thing okay this is this is something that's meaningful this is feasible this can be done and so on i keep going to the d3js site and getting enamored by all the graphs that i see there but then i really don't know what to do with them except that i love some of those graphs okay so uh, the second is that you can actually start making demands of us and that this was one of the first questions that she uh, raised as the objective of this whole camp that if you can tell us look we want to know this kind of data so you provide us a pipe which can give you this kind of data okay so we could we could perhaps enable it it's just that we don't know that that should be done we had not visualized that that is an essential ingredient to this whole thing we are open to the idea we need to work out mechanisms we need to convince hundreds of people but we will do it but we we do want those pipes to be established data input processes have a lot of problems parthajit will be mentioning some of those uh, professor mata will also be mentioning some of those the the validity of data the, the if if the question itself is meaningless to that person who's filling it up that person doesn't care what he is filling into it and there will be there will be lot of garbage data that is coming in from there which need not be so there are ways i'm not looking at validation rules i'm not looking at restrictions onto the data that is being input but then helping people understand what these inputs are and why it should be given, how it should be given so whatever be the ways in which you do that and then i want you to participate in this whole chain thank you